Hey everyone. In this video, I want to dive into the try catch error handling inside our PowerShell scripts and also have a quick look at the right verbose, right debug that might help us day to day. As always, if this is useful, a like, subscribe, comment, and share is appreciated. Hit that bell icon to get notified. And I'm going to start to do more community interactions. So if you've subscribed, you'll be able to see those. So I really just want to dive into what happens when we get some error actually in our PowerShell. So if we jump over to VS Code, firstly, the docs are great. The whole exception documentation is phenomenal. I'm going to link to that in the description. Definitely take a look at that. But let's start off just looking at a regular error. Let's say I go and get some content from a path that doesn't actually exist. And we can see, hey, cannot find the drive. We can see this error down the bottom. A drive with the name R does not exist. Now, I could also just throw my own error using the throw command. But before I do that, well, I can look at what the last error was. I can do get error. Now, when we run get error, we can see a whole bunch of information. Hey, I can see I got this drive not found exception down here. I can also see information about the target object, the category, the item name, the target, the stack trace, message. That's a very useful one that we can actually call on and get the detail around. And um, the source, so systemmanagement.automation huge amounts of info available. It also writes that to dollar error. Now this is kind of cumulative. So I can see it adds it to this variable for my session. So if I went and through my own error, if I jump up, okay, so exception John's error, well, I can still do get error again, and it's gonna show me, hey, John's error. But now if I look at the error variable, I can see two errors. I can see, hey, the last error was John's error, and then there was this, hey, get content, the one before. But really, we want to try and handle this uh, a different way. Now, I can write errors to my own custom variable. So here you can see all I've added is error variable bad things. So now if I run this, same error, but now I can actually look at bad things and hey, look, there's the error for that command I ran. I could even write code to check, well, does it actually have anything in it? And here you can say, okay, well, if there is something, I it's not null, then you can see here, hey, look, foreground blue, background white, had an issue. And then you can actually see I'm diving into the exception part of the error and getting the message component which in this case was the cannot find drive, a drive with the name R does not exist. So I can do things with the error variables. And note, this little script here is in my GitHub repo. And again, I've linked to that in the description as well. But the better option is to actually use a try catch. Hey, I want to try and do something. And then if there's an error, catch it and do something specific in this piece of code. So what I'm gonna try now is, hey, I'm wrapping what I want to do in the try. So in this case, what I want to try is get content. On this path, I know it doesn't exist. Now, if there's an exception, then it will call my catch block of code here. Something went wrong. So let's try that. Execute. Um, well, I don't actually think that worked. It just gave me the same standard kind of error I don't see my something went wrong line. So why didn't that work? The reason is try catch catches a terminating error. Whereas that path not found is not a terminating error. So let's do a try catch this time calling just complete garbage. That means it's terminating. It's going to cause a problem. And I should see no idea what that was. And sure enough, I do. Hey, I can see in my output down the bottom, no idea what that was because it was terminating. Now, if I ordinarily just ran that one line, I get this whole set of things. So somehow I need to make those commands that aren't normally terminating, a terminating, i.e. a stop event. 
So what I'm going to do here is I can add to the end of my regular PowerShell commands an error action. So I'm going to say error action stop. So that now makes it terminating. So if I try this block of code again, and all I've changed is added the error action stop, well now it doesn't output the regular error, now it outputs my something went wrong. That command executing now has an error action of stop, i.e. terminating, so my catch can, well, catch it. Now, there are different types of error actions. In my case, I had it to stop. But if we just actually delete this for a second and we kind of type error action and then we just start typing something. So I can see, hey, look, there's silently continue, there's stop, there's suspend. There's a whole bunch of different options to me. So I'm actually going to do this time silently continue. So let's see what happens when I run this. So there's no error. But it did still error. It just silently continued. If I do get error, I can see it's still there. It's still that, hey, drive not found. I can still see, hey, not there, 42, proving it actually was this error that is actually causing this. But it just silently carried on. So this is just kind of a note that there are different types of error action. Now, I can absolutely look at the details of that error. So this time, instead of just writing some, hey, I fell over and I can't get up, we're actually going to get the error message. Now, we can use the dollar underscore, that's the same as dollar PS item. I'm going to look at the exception and the message, and I'm going to store that in this error message variable. So instead of having that kind of glaring output it normally gives, I can now control that. So what I'm going to do is write output, hey, something went wrong in the message, and then I'm going to use write host, just so I can do some different formatting, to output the entire exception. And then also, to demonstrate I can use PS item instead of dollar underscore, I'm going to output the invocation info, i.e. the information that led up to actually having this, where the calls came from. So now if I take this and execute, we get a whole bunch of different information. Let's make this a bit bigger for a second. So firstly, okay, we get our something went wrong, and then it added the message. Then we can see here, I've actually got my exception with my blue on white output. And then I can see that invocation info the invocation name, pipeline length, I can see all the things that actually led up to that. So I get that full set of information. So this is where it gets really powerful that, hey, I can use the exception, I can get the details of the exception, there's all different components actually to that exception. And the documentation goes into huge details about this. Now potentially, I may want to do different things depending on the type of error. So what I can actually do is have different types of catch. So here, I've got this gobbledygook error. So this is going to be a command not found. So notice here I've got a catch if it is command not found. And then I've got kind of a default catch for everything else. So if I do the try catch here, calling my non-existent command, hey, no idea what this command is. That's the output I get because it was a command not found exception. I don't get it just outputting the overall exception. So I can do some really nice things in here to actually work at, hey, I might get different types of exception. I want to do different things. So I can use that with the actual type of exception I see. Now, what if I can't use that error action stop? So there's actually an error action preference. This is a variable. And if we look at this, we can see the default for my environment is continue down here on the bottom. So I can see here, my action preference is just continue. 
So what we could actually do, if we're in a situation where maybe I can't set the error action to stop, maybe I'm calling saying outside a PowerShell, what I could actually do is I could change the default error action preference to stop. Now, I want to be careful with this. I don't want to just set it to a new value and then just carry on. So what I would do is I'd want to store the current value, do whatever I want to do after I've set it to what I want, i.e. stop, and then put it back, which is what we're going to do in this script. So what we're going to do here is, as we can see, the first thing is we're going to capture the current value into a current error action preference. Then I'm going to set it to what I want it to be, i.e. stop. And then I'm doing that regular get content command, but notice I don't have the dash error action at the end of it. Now I have a catch, something went wrong, write out the message, but then I need to put it back no matter what, whether it failed or not, I have to set the error action preference back to what it was before. So this is where we use finally. So what finally lets us do is, error or not, this code will always run. So finally, set the error action preference back to what it was originally, i.e., that current error action preference variable I created where I copied in the original value. So I'm going to set it back. So let's kind of see this little part in action. So if I just run this, so it, it, it got caught, even though I didn't do the error action stop, because I set the default, and it outputted in my formatting, hey, the message with that blue on white. But if I actually look at my error action preference, it still continue. It, it all got set back. So if I have a scenario where I can't do error action stop, but I want to still handle that in my try catch, then I can set the error action preference. But make sure you set it back afterwards. Now, just a little note. If I'm calling, let's say, something from cmd.exe. So here I'm using invoke expression. And I'm saying, hey, I want to call command.exe. And I want it to run the command slash c dir on that no existent file. So if I capture that output, notice it outputted it to screen. The error is actually on my screen. System cannot find the path specified. If I look at my variable, no error. This is because in the command environment, there's actually many different outputs, but standard out is number one, standard error is number two. So if I want to catch the errors as well, I can redirect two to one, i.e. standard error go to standard out. So now if I execute this, notice nothing went to screen, and my variable to capture the output now has that error in it. So that was kind of just a, a few little things around actually leveraging that try catch. Um, and it's not complicated. I can just have those different blocks, different types of catch depending on what I wanted. Now, I wanted to finish on one other thing, and that was kind of right output, right verbose, right debug. Because um, I know when I started out, and I still do sometimes, if I hit a problem, I quickly add in a right output in my code to try and see where in maybe a logic path it's going, try and see what the variables are. Now, if I want to see the variables, really I should just be debugging, and then I can add watches on variables. But maybe, hey, I just want some information, or maybe instead of commenting my code, which often gets overlooked and doesn't get updated, maybe I want to be able to run it and actually have more output in certain scenarios. Maybe there's a problem, I want to see different types of information. And rather than adding in commands and commenting them out and adding them, write verbose and write debug can be super, super powerful. So in this case, I'm just going to have a function. Now this function is just going to, it's sad, it's going to create a random number, and then depending on the number I output, from that randomization, it's gonna output one of three kind of good morning messages, England, America, who knows what. So if I just define this function, so I've defined the function, I can now do get random message sad. Uh, good morning to thee. So that would, based on the code, tell me the number was, um, Great or equal to four and less than seven, so four, five, or six. 
But maybe this was a far more complicated script. This is obviously super, super simple. I would like to kind of maybe see more information or see debugging information depending on what I was doing. So now I've got a different version of this. And there's really just three things. The first is I'm adding commandlet binding. Now what this does is it gives me the ability to use things like dash verbose, dash debug. Because if I look at my get random message sad and do dash, there, I'm hitting tab. There, there is nothing. I can't do anything. So commandlet binding is going to add those for me. I'm still just going to maybe look at if they're parameters. I don't have any. But now what I'm doing is write verbose, generating a random number. Write verbose. Number is I'm outputting what the value of the variable is. Just give me some extra info. And now maybe if I was having problems in the future or whatever that is, now I've got a write debug, start of switch statement. Then I've added to the end of each of my statements, I've used a semicolon rather than doing multiple lines. Hey, my logic part, which logic gate did it go to? Hey, this is less than four. Then I've got, hey, between four and six. And then, hey, the default. So if I define this function by just, again, calling this little bit of code here, so that's done. So if I do get random message, firstly, if well, let's just run it. Now it says no extra output. It just runs exactly as we would expect. Now if I do up arrow and do dash and tab, suddenly I have these options, arguments, verbose, debug. I have these other things that I can now do because of that commandlet binding. And if we do verbose, let's just do dash verbose. Hey, okay, it's generating a random number. The number is eight, then top of the morning. So it only shows me that if I add that dash verbose to the execution. Maybe I'm having problems. I don't understand which logic path it's going down. So I could add dash debug. Okay, start the switch statement. So I know it's going into that flow. Good morning to the, oh, it was debug four to six. Okay, that helps. I know where it is in my code. I could absolutely combine those things. I could do debug and verbose. So, hey, generating a random number, number is eight, starting the switch statement. Okay, it went to the default. So, obviously, the default was the seven, eight, nine, ten. So, those help me much more than me just, hey, on this original script I had at the top, saying, oh, I'm, I'm curious what's going on. Okay, let's just add in a right output number. Okay, well then it works, I'll delete it or I'll comment that thing out. And if I needed it again, I would uncomment it. it it's just kind of ugly and I really don't want to be <laughs> in that world. So the use of the right verbose and the right debug are super, super powerful to actually help us when we're trying to troubleshoot things, uh, when we maybe want just more information about things. Maybe if it's more complicated, maybe there's a whole bunch of internal information that normally we don't care about but maybe, hey, someone does care, well, we could output it if they wanted that extra information. Whereas the debug is more, hey, look, maybe I'm trying to track the flow, or maybe I'm trying to see some variables inside. I could output that information to help when there are things going wrong. And rather than having to change the script, I can say, hey, okay, run this command in with dash debug. And then it gives me the information I would need to work out, hey, exactly why is this behaving the way it's behaving? So that was it. I hope that was useful. Again, in the description below, I've got the link to these two files if you wanted to play around with them. But until next time, take care.